Good morning and welcome to our inaugural end of financial year webinar focusing on the economy and the financial services sector. As we approach the end of a turbulent financial year, a perfect storm is brewing for Australia's banks. Interest rates are climbing, mortgage stress is on the rise, buy now pay later brands are eating into the bank's lending and the market value of banks is dropping. Today we'll be taking a deep dive into the emerging world of pain for banks and examining the pivotal role that trust and distrust will play in determining the winners and losers in the new financial year. But let's start with the broader economic context. As you all know, inflation is accelerating so fast that even the Reserve Bank governor is spooked. As of the March quarter, inflation had jumped 4% to 5.1%. That's up from only 1.1% just a year ago. And inflation expectations, that's what Australians expect inflation to be, are now up to 5.7%. Five weeks into the new Labor government, the ALP is now on 53.5%. The Coalition is on 46.5% on a two-party preferred basis. So the government is, is um, more popular now than when it first won at the election. Consumer confidence and business confidence are both way below 100, which means they're in negative territory. But it really looks as if consumer confidence might have bottomed out and is now starting to turn up. So, a perfect storm brewing around the banking sector. The big four used to have an oligopoly position. That's when a very large industry sector is dominated by just a few major players. Not so long ago, the big four banks enjoyed outstanding returns on equity, strong credit growth, limited bad debts, and really very little competition. While they now have much more competition, they still dominate home lending. In fact, the big four account for $1.87 trillion of the $2 trillion in home loans. That's both good news and bad news for those banks. The potential downside of that position is that, of course, as house prices soared over the last couple of years, many Australians took out high debt-to-income ratio loans. For example, almost 300,000 Australians borrowed more than six times their income, or borrowed more and or borrowed more than 90% of their new home's value. This means hundreds of thousands of Australians are critically vulnerable to every increase in interest rates. And this is the group the Reserve Bank identifies as most at risk of tipping into mortgage stress. And of course, if they default on their loans, it hits the bank's bottom line. According to Roy Morgan data on mortgage stress, mortgage stress is also set to be much more widespread. This graph shows that the current cash rate is pushing just under 800,000 Australians potentially into mortgage stress. By the time the cash rate goes up another full percentage point, which we expect it will, nearly 20% of mortgage holders will be at risk. That's not good news for Australians with a housing loan, and it's certainly not good news for the banks who gave them that loan make their money from lending. Home loans, business loans, personal loans, and so on. But as interest rates go up, appetite for borrowing goes down. So the banks will need to be even more competitive to attract new customers. And that will eventually reduce margins. They're already losing personal credit customers to buy now, pay later companies like Afterpay. So what does all this mean? The halcyon days for the big four banks may well be coming to an end. The market value of the major banks has fallen 17% on average since the Reserve Bank surprised us all with a 50 basis point cash increase in June. And analysts have dramatically marked down the future share price target for the majors by an average of 15%. This means banks will be worth significantly less in the coming financial year and to attract new customers away from their competitors, they'll have to increasingly focus on how trusted and particularly how distrusted they are by Australian borrowers. We'll look a little bit more of that later. So how bad will the economic headwinds get? The runaway inflation in the US, the UK, and to a degree here in Australia, has central banks lifting cash rates to bring inflation under control. 
So this has caused several respected economists to predict that while the central banks might be able to bring inflation under control by lifting interest rates, the price to pay may well be a recession. Several global investment banks believe the probability of recession is on the rise. For example, one analyst, Morgan Stanley, last week wrote that the current Westpac share price implied a 65% possibility of a recession. Not sure the correlation, but that's what was said. Shortly, I'm going to ask legendary economics and business writer Robert Gottliebson what he thinks the likelihood of recession is. But my own view is that it really depends on employment, and especially unemployment. If unemployment's low, meaning everyone who wants a job can get one, the probability of recession is probably below 50%. That said, you all know the Roy Morgan real unemployment rate is over 8%. And of course, my view would change dramatically about a recession if the housing bubble burst and interest rates reached double digits. But let's see what Bob thinks. So let me introduce a living legend of business <laughs> and economics journalism and publishing. Robert Gottliebson. Bob, welcome to the Roy Morgan End of Financial Year webinar. My great pleasure. Fantastic. Now, I'd like to start with a really big picture question. So last week, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve in the US, Jerome Powell, acknowledged that a recession was a possibility. What's your view on the R word? I think there's a high likelihood of a, a, a mild recession in the States. But remember, he's got two, uh, two guns. He's got the interest rate gun, and he's got the fact that he's withdrawing money by cashing in his bonds. And he's got to get those two right. It's very easy if he does two, two of them together and he can overshoot and have a quite severe recession. Um, but he doesn't have to put everything on interest rates. He can do both. Mm -hmm. So there, is, there are people in the States who believe that they can get away with a mild recession um, nothing too serious. And of course, when that takes preeminence, you see the stock markets rise. Other times they get very jittery and they think, oh, it's going to, have a, it's going to be bad and down she'll go. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Let me change the topic a little bit. So this webinar is largely, as you know, about trust and distrust, and particularly in the financial sector. And one of our findings is that banks with a local presence and a, a culture, a local culture, like the Bendigo Bank, are much more trusted than the larger banks. Is this your experience, Bob? I, I, it is. I'd just like to take you back a little bit onto the banking sector though, mm. uh, in general, because we have in Australia a, uh, in some ways a more serious problem than the States. Because in the last two to three years, our banks loaned 30% of our housing stock at low token interest rates um, to people who were pretty marginal on the, on the income side. So uh, they acted in that way and that's making it extremely dangerous as we try to bring the economy back that these banks have loaned far too much money and too high a risk. So part of the distrust of big banks is the fact that they've just done that mm. and they've made our economy uh, much more hazardous than it was. Uh, I, I noticed though on a wider sphere that in your surveys you show that telecommunications companies led by Telstra are not trusted. Correct. And uh, I reckon the reason they're not trusted is that when something goes wrong you have to ring up. You know, years ago I could go to the a, or a maybe email. <laughs> yeah, or, or hopeless, no, no, no. <laughs> but, but you, 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 um, uh, you could go to a, a, a Telstra shop, but others too, and there'd be someone to help you. Yes. And now there's not, or it's very hard to get the help there. Um, uh, and so you have this, this process, and you learn after a while that you scream down the phone, right, and that gets you a bit of attention. <laughs> but, but it, it's trust, distrust. Yes. The magnificent thing about the Bendigo Bank is that when you have a problem, you know, you can try their phone system, but usually there's a branch not far away. Yes. And you go to the branch, and you know what? They fix it. There's a human being. A human being who will, if it can't be fixed, it can't be fixed. But if it's possible to fix it, they mm. do. And if they can't fix it, they'll explain very carefully why they can't, what the problem is. And there's nothing like that. These call centres, particularly ones with overseas call centres, yes. they are terrible things. And yeah. uh, they can fix very routine problems, but not much. They're so the, the um, 
the sort of IT that was meant to make our lives easier and simpler and frictionless has in fact introduced a whole range of other problems, hasn't it? It, it does do human. those things. Mm. It does make it, it's very good. But when it goes wrong, Absolutely. it is very difficult. But, and, it, and that's where you need, in my view, uh, call centres that are local, where they can speak the language easily and understand the business very well. Or you have branches that do these things, or a combination yeah. of both. Yeah. And uh, that's what the Bendigo Bank has done, uh, whereas the other banks have gradually contracted into the post office. Which is, uh, which is fine if you're just transacting, but no problems can be solved there. It's, it's, uh, and of course, if you're right, and there's a lot of people that aren't able to pay their mortgage or are worrying about it, they'll have a problem that they need to get resolved, won't they? Yes, and, and uh, you can't <laughs> place that up online. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> now, Bob, one of the um, other questions, the, we talk about the big four as if they're all kind of the same. But what we've seen of the big four, NAB has been the real big improver over this last few years. What do you think that's about? Do you think it's the CEO? It's a combination of two things, I think. Um, firstly, um, there have been CEO problems in three of the four banks. Yes. Uh, the Commonwealth uh, were, uh, appointed from internally and that's worked, worked well. And the National, uh, basically forced on them by the parliamentary inquiry, uh, went out and found a CEO had just rescued a UK bank but he was Australian, so he knew the Australian business. So they got into their business a, a, a very experienced banker. Ross McEwen. Yeah, Ross McEwen, who'd done yeah. a very good job overseas. And yes. and, uh, and the, the NAB wasn't too bad because a lot of the early work had actually been done by Thorne Byrne and, and his people, as the previous CEO. But the other thing about the NAB that differentiates it from, say, the Commonwealth and, and the other banks too, is that they a much, much bigger part of their business is business banking. Mm. Uh, and it's interesting what he doesn't open a whole lot of branches to cater for the business banking, but he it's a sort of a, a, a quasi Bendigo exercise. Uh, and what he's done is to recruit a whole lot of business bankers who get out on the road, and, and their job is to kick the tyres and go into the business and actually, yes. uh, or perhaps the person comes to them, but they are in the business banking business. And, and he actually recruits them on that basis. It's back to that personal touch, isn't it's it? Personal Even when touch. it's business to business. And, and therefore I've got my, whatever business might be, my tractor business or whatever, I go along and I deal with a particular person. Yes. Uh, and that person is a trained business banker. Uh, and that appears to have worked. Mm. Well, it does, doesn't it? Mm. Now, what about this BNPL, as they call it, buy now, pay later category, like after pay? Well, now so, you, you, you know, I don't know who's in your audience, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully lots of people. But, no, no. you know, as mortgage repayments go up in the next financial year and homeowners go into mortgage stress, what, what do you think about these BNPLs? Well, I've got to tell you, a mate of mine uh, is in the sort of money lending business and he, he kept very... He's in it, but not much. Um, and his view was this that when the crunch came, the sort of situation you're talking about. Yeah. Um, uh, and you're talking about. Yes. We're both talking yes. about. <laughs> 500 bucks, small amounts of money are very expensive to collect because you have to put all your, your weight in there. If you're collecting $10,000, yes, or higher figures or lower figures, so yeah. thousands of dollars, it's least, at least it's worth the effort. If you're trying to collect little amounts of money, it can be very expensive. Mm. Uh, it's fine. We, we're just at a, we've just been through a period of Lots and lots of money, liquidity everywhere. So people have paid it and there's no problem. No, no, if the interest rates rise too far and these 30% of the home loan volume can't pay, guess where they, they'll pay the mortgage right. Mm. They'll pay that, but other things will miss out. And yeah. I reckon first of all, with that $500 they had to have to pay. Mm. There's so many things all related, isn't there? Mm. It's mm. like mm. you pull one little string. And, and finally, Bob, What's your position on the Reserve Bank's performance over the past couple of years? Um, I'd say, let's use three letters, bad. Um, they have performed very badly. And, um, what have they done and, wrong? And let's look at why they did that, first of all. Yeah. Um, and because it's all very easy to say, oh, Philip, Philip Lowe is no good or that's no good. They were structurally badly situated and they were primed to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, they've got, once upon a time, they had a, 
network, this is the staff, network of, uh, of contacts around the country. They knew what was happening right around the country, not just from the statistics, they knew it. Now it's all, like they, they, they've got these, this uh, place in Martin Place, and all the economists are stuck in the place, they talk to other economists, yeah. and their knowledge is the, is the statistics, and the statistics are late and often wrong. So well, some of them are Roy Morgan statistics, oh, so they're, they're right. on time and yes. absolutely <laughs> right, Bob. But, but what happens is that, that, <laughs> that the housing, uh, some, some event takes place this month, and it's three or four months before that yes. gets through to the official statistics, so it's too late. And they had a board of good people. I look at that board and I said, that's a, that's a good board. But then I think about it, and none of them was a, a senior CEO. There was a, a, my, a guy from Fortescue that, that covered that, if you like, but the rest of them, no. And, and therefore, when the economists at the, uh, in the Reserve Bank came to them and said, uh, here's a pile of statistics and this is what it all means, they didn't have the instant knowledge to say, to say with qualification, look, that's fine, but what's really happening yes. now is this, this and this. See how Bunnings, Coles, Woolworths, yep. even the union officials, are the people that are on the ground and can speak authoritatively yes. to the, the managers of the bank, which is the governor and the deputy governor and the treasury person. So they really were dealing with outdated data. They thought that they didn't have any idea that the economy was roaring ahead and they thought it was slumping. And they just kept stimulating. They stimulated not only with those low rates, but encouraging, they are on the panel and encouraged the banks to borrow. Oh, sorry, to lend. Yes. Um, to lend. And, and at the same time, they, they did their quantitative easing and they started buying all these bonds. The US had tapered their buying. Oh, the Reserve Bank, let's go, let's go. It looks bad from these statistics. So they overstimulated the economy. And the government didn't, it stimulated too. So we had, there was a double bunger. Mm. And this overstimulation of the economy has now led to, uh, in the words of the Reserve Bank, 7% price rises. Um, and maybe it's going to go to 10, I don't know. But that, now suddenly that's coming into the wages level. And they know, the Reserve Bank now do understand the problem uh, that they have created. And it's, it is, it's a not easy thing to fix. It's a very delicate thing to fix, mm, isn't yeah, it? Very easy to run it because of uh, the Commonwealth Bank. We talked about them earlier. They know this situation better than anybody else because guess who loaned most of the money we just talked about? It was them. Yes. <laughs> Others did too though. Don't, don't. And so they're telling the Reserve Bank, be very careful. As yes. to ha if you follow the market with higher interest rates, you will bring on a thumper of a recession because we've lent all this money out and these people can't pay if you do that. <laughs> now, Because all our loans are flexible interest rates. All is wrong, but a great many of them mm. are flexible interest rates. So it goes straight out of the person's pocket. So, uh, no, they, they were badly structured. They didn't pick the problem early enough and they kept stimulating too long. Mm. Very interesting. So, thanks Bob. Thank you. Insightful and wise, mostly wise as usual. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Let's look at the pivotal role of trust and distrust. There really is no sector in which trust is more important than in the banking sector. We trust banks to hold our money. We trust banks with our most detailed personal and financial information. We trust banks to give us the money we need to buy a house and barring disasters, not to ask for the money back until we sell the house. And yet, despite trusting banks, we also distrust them. In fact, we really distrust them. So let's have a look at trust and distrust. For five years, we at Roy Morgan have been asking 1,800 Australians each and every month which brands they trust and which brands they distrust. We also ask our respondents why, why they trust or distrust those nominated brands. And that's what our clients really value most the actual words that the people say, getting under the bonnet to see where they're getting it right and where they're risking real damage to their brand. So you'll see throughout this short webinar, I use the language of net trust or net distrust. These are scores we calculate by netting or subtracting a brand's distrust score from its trust score. The research is open-ended and completely unprompted. We don't provide a context like thinking about banks and that means for people who nominate a brand as a trusted brand or a distrusted brand, it's so top of mind that they put it ahead of all other brands swirling around in their consciousness. Let's get started. 
we measure both trust and distrust. Trust is just the shiny side, the positive side of the coin. Trust is fundamental, it's the glue that holds relationships, both personal and business, together. Trust enables business to function. It underpins brand reputation. It creates customer loyalty and promotes customer advocacy and referrals. Trust makes first party data collection possible, collecting all of that personal information. And trust impacts revenue growth and increases market capitalization. But perhaps most importantly, trust is the cornerstone of a sustainable future. As some of you will have heard me say before, trust accounts for around 75% of a brand's reputation. That's not soft economics, that's hard market capitalization, essential to the banks, as we just heard. Just look at what Unilever CEO says about trust. He says, trust is our most important value driver. Unilever's market capitalization is 130 billion euro, but our asset value is only 30 billion. The balance is made up of trust or reputation. That's an extraordinarily valuable asset. Now, pretty much everyone measures the positives, trust, net promoter score, and customer satisfaction, but only Roy Morgan measures all those three and distrust. And it's distrust where brand shock occurs. Just think about the financial services brand AMP and how soaring levels of distrust all but destroyed its share price and market capitalization. This is a potent warning to any major bank that ignores the toxic power of distrust and the material impact it can inflict on market value. And it's not just AMP, across all industry sectors, distrust is like the canary in the mine. In a very practical sense, distrust kills audience engagement and all engagement. It's the tipping point for reputational damage. It impacts commercial and economic outcomes. It prevents website visitors opting in. Distrust is the harbinger of an unsustainable future. So looking at the Roy Morgan Risk Monitor data up to the end of March this year, I can reveal that the banking industry enjoys the third highest level of trust in the economy. See that green bar second from the right. As I said, we trust the banking system. That's the good news. The bad news is that the banking sector also has the highest distrust score of any industry sector. Just look at the deep red column of distrust, second from the right. This graph also shows net trust scores and net distrust scores. The black dots, so when the banking industry's distrust score is subtracted from its trust score, banking emerges as the second most distrusted sector in net terms. Social media has less distrust than banks, but because it has virtually no trust, when it's all netted out, social media takes the biggest loser title. As a matter of interest, the supermarkets and retail continue to take out the biggest winner titles. Now, when Roy Morgan talks about the banking industry, we define that by aggregating all of the bank brands that people mentioned, as well as the trust and distrust of banks in general into an industry category. So sometimes when we ask people, which brands do you trust, they say banks. Sometimes when we say, which brands do you distrust, they say banks, all banks, most banks, banks in general. So we've, we've put this banks in general category together as distinct from the people who say, I trust ANZ or I distrust a particular brand. And we can see from this graph that the banking industry spends most of its life in net distrust territory. It had a moment in the sun in early 2020, but the fallout after the Financial Services Royal Commission continued, pushing banks back into distrusted territory. And the industry has stayed there ever since. This is really important with so much distrust, something the majors don't measure, their ability to protect their loan books will be severely compromised. Smaller banks like Bendigo and ING are so much more trusted that customers will, as economic conditions worsen, potentially turn to them and away from major bank brands that they so distrust. Now we'll look more closely at banks in general. 
While we know Australians trust that the banking system will be safe, they really don't like banks in general. This graph shows that banks in general, that's the orange line, are more distrusted than the overall industry. And it shows that banks in general are more distrusted than bank brands themselves. Yes, it's a nuance, but an important one. Banks are trusted to look after our money, but we're not happy about it. And sometimes we deal with them quite reluctantly. That makes big bank maintenance of their lending fragile in the face of increasing competition. Just think about how the BNPL, the buy now pay later sector, has sucked so much high margin business out of the bank's coffers. It's likely from the data that many Australians are just looking for an opportunity to switch from a big four bank to something else. This graph shows the big four banks, that's the black line, continuously in that net distrust zone. But look at other banks, the green line, they're well entrenched in net trust territory. And if you're wondering who these other banks are, the data reveals that more than half of them are represented by Bendigo Bank, ING, Suncorp and St George. This is a graphic depiction of how high levels of trust in banks are being eroded by their distrust. Green is trust, red is distrust and the black line is the net score for the banking industry. Even more graphic, this shows the trust and distrust for banks in general. Remember, all banks, most banks, some banks, banks in general. It'll be fascinating over the next five years to track the success of financial services organisations that don't have the word bank in their name. Latitude Financial, Afterpay, ING, American Express and many others. Interestingly, Macquarie recently dropped the word bank from its branding and marketing. The Royal Commission exposed in stark relief that the big banks were in business for their shareholders and that their customers were really just a means to an end. Just look at these respondents verbatims, exactly what they said when they told us why they trusted or distrusted a brand. The big banks are caught in a bind. They have to trumpet their huge profits to attract new shareholders and keep the current ones happy. But every time they announce huge quarterly, half yearly and annual profits, it reminds their customers and Australians that their bank is really in business for shareholders, not them. This graph shows how strong that too motivated by profit reason for distrusting banks really is. It maps reasons for distrust and the green line rising above all the others is for profit motivation and greed. And to clarify, that's almost a million Australians saying they distrust banks in general because banks are too motivated by profit. Before we leave the banking industry as a whole to take a deeper look at individual bank brands, we should look at some of the respondent attitudes to the elephant in the room, rising interest rates. So what do Australians say about banks in relation to rate hikes? They're more interested in profit than service. Look how quickly they raise interest rates as opposed to bringing them down. They will lend to people who may not be able to meet repayments when interest rates rise. They're devious. Never reduce their interest rates when the Reserve Bank does, but put it up at the drop of a hat. So the Roy Morgan Risk Monitor data reveals that the level of Australians paying off their mortgage and worried about interest rates is rising. It's up from 27% in March 2021 to 44.7% now in March 2022, almost double. During the same period, Australians paying off their home who believed the Australian economy appeared to be improving, the opposite fell from 58.9 to 34.4. These mortgage holders are a real litmus test. Finally, how is all this distrust for major banks and the perfect storm brewing around the traditional banking industry playing out in the inescapable reality of financial results. Well, according to APRA, according to the bank's own annual reports and the Reserve Bank of Australia, the profitability of major banks is in decline and in 2021 was eclipsed by other Australian-owned brands. The storm clouds truly are gathering.
Let's now move to the actual bank brands underpinning all these trends and results. I think after hearing and seeing what we just did, we'd imagine the smaller other banks would be more trusted than the majors. But is that so? Well, of course it is. The big four, as we've seen, are all more distrusted than trusted. On the left, we see the most trusted bank brands are smaller, community-style banks, subsidiaries of majors, or in the case of ING, a bank with its headquarters in another country. So we don't hear too much about anything wrong that's going on. Bendigo Bank is the most trusted bank in Australia, with ING second. The difference in scores between these two is, is not even statistically significant. They're really neck and neck in those net trust stakes. But more on that later. And there's Macquarie in the middle in what we call a neutral position. That simply means its trust and distrust scores are identical, netting out to zero. If we take a closer look now at the big four, we see that NAB, that black line, is the big winner, moving from being the most distrusted earlier on to becoming the least distrusted of the majors. It's still in distrust territory but in fact, it's getting pretty close to neutral. There is a direct correlation between NAB's dramatic recovery and the appointment of CEO Ross McEwen. On the other hand, Westpac moved from the least distrusted to the most distrusted following the money laundering scandal exposed by Austrac in late 2019. The majors recognise clearly the importance of trust. Just look at these two statements as an example. What they're perhaps unaware of is the need to be first measuring their levels of distrust and then working to reduce them. Over the years of Roy Morgan undertaking this trust and distrust tracking and deep research, one thing has become absolutely crystal clear. To improve trust, a brand must first measure and reduce its distrust. It's the only way. A good example again is NAB. Its dramatic improvement has been driven not by a huge increase in trust, but by significant decreases in distrust. A new CEO introducing a new collegial culture to the business, plus the rollout of digital and social media tools during COVID, did so much to reduce the brand's distrust. NAB is now on track to potentially be in positive net trust territory in the near term. But is it a similar picture for the small banks? Let's compare the two most trusted bank brands in Australia, Bendigo and ING. I mentioned earlier that the gap between ING and Bendigo was tiny. Since COVID began, ING has been in the lead, more than Bendigo, but gosh, they're close. But as of the 31st of March, 2022, Bendigo was just ahead, most trusted. In customer satisfaction, however, ING is consistently ahead of Bendigo. This graph shows that while there are some similarities in results for trust and distrust and customer satisfaction, customer satisfaction is no proxy for trust and distrust. Returning now to trust and distrust, the net trust gap between ING and Bendigo and the big four is closing. ING and Bendigo need to work on building trust and the big four need to work hard on measuring and decreasing distrust. If you can't measure it, you can't fix it. Now the non-bank financial services sector comprises almost 60 financial service companies other than banks. They range from insurers, card providers, financial planners, superannuation companies, buy now pay later brands, and this sector is more distrusted than trusted. Looking back again at this same chart where we look across the brands, we track trust and distrust for 48 brands in this non-banking financial services sector. And you can see from this graph that while distrusted, it is less distrusted than the banking industry. And of all the non-bank financial services brands, PayPal is the most trusted. But as we'll see, it's in decline. And Australian Super is snapping at its heels. Only two brands have a net distrust score, AMP and Bitcoin. AMP persistently continues to attract significant distrust following the major scandals and the Banking Royal Commission. 
that said, AMP's um, CEO, new CEO, Alexis George, really does seem to understand exactly what needs to be done. And I believe that she'll be doing it. She seems to understand the critical need to reduce distrust before trust can be rebuilt. MLC and Afterpay hold neutral positions. I mentioned that Australian Super, that's the red line in the chart, was snapping at the heels of category leader PayPal. In truth, it's more by default than by design. PayPal appears to be on a kamikaze mission to bring, bring it within sort of striking distance of Australian Super. It's coming down rather than Australian Super nipping at its heels by increasing. And looking at the trends for the two most distrusted brands, AMP is steadily recovering from multiple scandals. It remains, however, far more distrusted than any other brand in the industry. Bitcoin is becoming more distrusted over time. You'd have to say it's a surprise that the leading cryptocurrency brand is less distrusted than AMP, a once trusted Australian icon. Finally, let's take a quick look at the expanding BNPL, buy now, pay later category. This relatively new category has inflicted real pain on the bank's bottom line, the majors in particular. Remember, banks make most of their money from their loan book, and buy now, pay later brands like Afterpay have significantly reduced the bank's ability to make money from their credit card businesses, which are effectively personal loans. There are now over half a dozen products, including NAB, NAB now, buy it, pay later, Combank's Step Pay and PayPal's Pay in Four. However, Roy Morgan data shows that the market leader remains after pay. As interest rates continue to increase, our analysis is that even more consumers will potentially move away from high interest credit cards to the no interest lending offered by brands like Afterpay and Zip. The real question is will BNPL brands continue to be allowed to operate in this largely deregulated market? Or will they be pulled inside the tent with the big banks? And what about trust? Why do Australians trust and distrust Afterpay? Many people categorise buy now, pay later services as lenders of last resort. It's interesting, that is not supported by the evidence. Millions of Australians who can well afford to pay cash for the product or service that they're buying choose the four payment model. If we look at what they say, we have people saying, I'm a long time consumer of this service, I'm reliant on it and I have no issues with it. And another person said, it's become well known and popular, is a unique way to pay. I love the idea of splitting up a payment into smaller payments. So it's not just for those who can't afford to do anything else. The dark side of the coin is, as always, distrust. And there are many Australians who deeply distrust the buy now, pay later sector, believing it does the devil's work, another way of getting into debt, marketed with positive spin to trap people, profiting off financially vulnerable people. They prey on people's weaknesses and take advantage of people who are financially illiterate not just Afterpay, but all buy now, pay later companies. Well, that brings us to the end of our inaugural end of financial year webinar. I think the year ahead will be a wild ride, so strap in. I'd once again like to thank the wonderful Robert Godlebson for his wise contribution. I'd also like to thank Dr. Ross Honeywell and David Laffin, the head of the Roy Morgan Risk Lab, working with Adam Ray and Tom Mullins and the data scientists at Roy Morgan for turning trends into data science. And don't forget to subscribe to the Roy Morgan YouTube channel. Oh, and I've been told to say that a full report on all today's data, plus a much deeper dive, is available from the Roy Morgan online store. Thank you for spending time with us this morning, and I look forward to seeing you for the next quarterly update.